open officially. Okay, I say again, is there any announcements or anything anybody would like to say before we get started? If anybody feels led, please feel free to open us up with a prayer. If not, let us pray. Father God, we come before you on this Wednesday, the fourth day of, se of September. We thank you, Lord, for this day, because this is a, a gift from you. It's a day that we, have, we did not make. We have not seen it before, nor shall we see it again. But we pray, Heavenly Father, a prayer of thanksgiving for this day, for this hour, for this opportunity to study your word. We ask, Lord, that you lend us your presence, that we might rightly divide the words of truth, and that that truth, which is your word and the seed of life, will take root in our hearts and in our minds and bring forth its perfect fruit in due, in due season. Lord God, again, we just say thank you because you've been so good, so merciful, so loving, and so kind to each one of us that if we had 10,000 tongues, we could not thank you enough. Father God, we thank you for the good days. We thank you for the bad days. We thank you for this day. And Lord God, we ask and pray it all in the matchless name of your son, Jesus our Christ. And we say, amen. Ms. Graham, are you with us? I am with you today. Thank you. Would you grace us with a musical selection, please? Gladly. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amen. 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 Do not pass me by while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Is it, is it possible if, if God is everywhere all the time, knows everything, and has all power, how is it that he could ever possibly pass us by? Is that possible? No, it's not no. possible for him, but sometimes we don't recognize that he is there. Mm -hmm. Look at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm hot today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That is exactly right. So that song while it is definitely inspiring, it is soothing, it is comforting, but God never passes us by, but we, like his disciples that we looked at a, a couple of weeks ago and, and continue to look at, 
we pass God by because we're looking for him in the wrong places or with the wrong spirit or with the wrong attitude. Because God is everywhere all the time, all at once. So if we look for him, he's always right there. He stands at the door and he knocks. But oftentimes we're looking for what we want or what we think God should be and not who he is or what he wants. And so we think he's passing us by because he's not doing what we think he ought to be doing. But he's always doing exactly what he intends to do. Thank you, Ms. Graham, for that song. Very encouraging, very inspiring, very thought-provoking. Again, very today welcome. we are in the 19th. I'm sorry. I say you're very welcome. Okay. Deacon Davis. Yes. That song is also appropriate for the for the scripture we're reading about because Zacharias didn't want him to pass him by. Or Zacchaeus, rather, didn't want him to pass uh -huh. him by. So that's appropriate, not only, you know, for us, but back then for him. And, and it, it's good to, that for a lot of different reasons, that Zacchaeus story is a wonderful story. But think about what did Zacchaeus do? Did he just sit somewhere and demand that Jesus come by him? No, he saw him and realizing, like some of us, he's a high challenge that he ran uh -huh. and got into a tree to make okay. sure he could see him. And then he reached out, he, you know, and Jesus saw him up there. But so and, he and, didn't pass him by. He didn't let right. him pass him by. He, exactly. Zacchaeus didn't just sit by hoping Jesus wouldn't pass him by. Zacchaeus made sure, even if you try to pass me by, I'm going to at least see you. So he took actions to see God, to see Jesus, to see the Messiah. And that's what we have to do. We can't just sit in our little pity party and, and expect Jesus to stop, or God to stop his program and pick up ours. We got to get in the midst of where God is. And because he's the, when, where God is, there are blessings to be had. So Zachary said, if he's if he's traveling down Main Street, I'm going to go find me a, a, a position on Main Street where I'm guaranteed to see him when he comes by. And then not only did, did Jesus, was not only Jesus aware of him, but he called him down. Called him front and center and ministered to him specifically. And, and called him by his name. Called him by his name. So he knew he was there right. because you are seeking me. And I know this. I know when, pe when people are seeking me and I will be faithful to meet them when they are looking for me because I'm standing there knocking. And if any man opens unto me, I will come in and sup with them. Ain't God good. So thank you for pointing that out, uh, that Zacchaeus story. And it is that song is certainly appropriate and relates to that story and, and what was taking place there. So again, focusing our attentions on that 11th verse. Again, this is the parable of the 10 pounds. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 27. So if somebody would, please take the first. The first four verses, so if you would, uh, or the first five, if you would go from 11 to 15. This is from the NIV. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minutes. But put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a de delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money 
in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, uh, you're... That was, oh, I'm sorry. That I'm was sorry. 15, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that reading. So, um, he, and so far in those first five verses, I think, yeah, it was five. Um, what's happening, what's happening in those verses? Jesus is relating another parable because um, he's getting closer to Jerusalem. And I guess most of the folks that were following him thought this is where it's going to happen, um, that mm -hmm. the kingdom of God was going to come into being once he gets to Jerusalem. The parable I mean, tells of... I'm sorry, go ahead. The parable goes on to explain the... Um, there was a king or a noble, someone of noble birth, rather, um, went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then he was going to come back. So he gave each of his servants a certain amount of money, and he tells them to put this money to work until I come back. Okay. Very good. Um so yeah, and in this story, who who is the nobleman? Who is this person of, of of noble birth? Who does that represent? I'm assuming that it's Jesus. Okay, yes, this 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 nobleman is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Who's the, who's the audience? Who's listening to this parable? Generally. Who's around Jesus at this time? Disciples. The disciples for sure. And Zacchaeus' family or household. Okay. And part Essentially, of the crowd. Yeah, it was, it was it was a large a large audience. Right. So it was people who were following him, who mm -hmm. were following him as he as he got closer to Jerusalem. The parable tells us as they were nigh to Jerusalem. That means they're getting real close to Jerusalem. Now the expectation was that this new kingdom was about to come to fruition. Was there a consensus? on what this kingdom was going to be? No. Okay. What were some people, what do you imagine some people were thinking it was going to be? That he was going to come and destroy the Romans and tear that kingdom down. And okay. And the Jews free from their bondage under that ruling. Okay. Certainly. So they were thinking about it in terms or some, I'm sure, were thinking about, maybe many, were thinking about it in terms of an earthly kingdom. Literally, he's going to tear down all the stuff that's in Jerusalem that's paying homage to the Romans or to anybody who's not of his, of his band. And he's going to reestablish a brand new earthly kingdom the way we understand kingdoms ought to be, which means there are going to be positions of power and influence, and boy, since we're right here close to him, we're going to get cherry positions in this new kingdom. And so Jesus tells them a parable. Now, what's taking, what's, what takes place in this parable to this point? He calls to him his servants, 10 of his servants, and he gives them, what does he give them? A pound of peace. So he, he distributes amongst 10 servants, 10 pounds. And a pound was equivalent to a, about three months wages. So he gives them with instructions. What were his instructions? Operate that until he returns. Right. Put it to work. It to to occupy work. this until I get back. Right. And occupy means put it to work. Turn it into more than what it is now. 
And when I come back, we'll take an accounting of what you've done with what I've given you. Now, any thoughts on that? We'll, we'll certainly push to that point. But um, any, any initial thoughts on, on this parable where this noble man is going off to be officially installed as king, then he's going to come back as king over these folks, over his citizens. How did his citizen? Well, we'll get that's a question that's on there. So that's that's the that's the setting. A no a person of noble birth calls his servants to him upon his at part as part of his preparation to depart from them to go and officially be installed as king. He gives them something before he leaves, gives them a pound, 10 different servants. He gives each one a pound and says, put it to work. While I'm gone, and when I get back, we'll settle up then. Okay. How did the, in verse 14, how did how does it say the citizens felt about him? Some hated him. Okay. And they didn't want them for their king. Yeah, it says here, but his citizens hated him. Right. It, it, didn't, it didn't sort out some or most. It says his citizen. Yes, I forgot. And we, we have established that the nobleman in this parable represents Jesus. Who would his, his citizens have been? His fellow Jews. Jews. His fellow Jews. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this parable is, is taking a, a real big swing at the Jews. It says his citizens, which means we're all part of the same community for whatever reason, either in this case, it was because we are all Jews. It says his citizens, it didn't say they disliked him or they didn't, they didn't really want him. They had other choices. They said, it said they hated him. How does how does one express hate? From uh, above, that this was a pretty rapid response and a pretty full scale. By our actions. By our actions. What are some of the things we do when we when we hate something? Can you repeat the last part of your question, there, Phil? I'm sorry. Just you how, might spread lies on them, or in some cases, past failures factored into the responses here. Okay, and somebody's background. Failed response to we rebel. We rebel against the leader. We rebel against them. Yeah. What is some, oh, what's is something we can we can say we safely hate? What's something we can safely say we hate? Sin. Sin. Okay. And what are we trying to do with sin? Not committed. We try to get rid of it, don't we? Right. Avoid we it. Want to bring, right. We want to bring it to an end once and for all. Kill it. Crush it. You might hate bugs invading your house, so when you see them, you don't escort them out the door. What do you do? You swap Kill the flying them, ones and, and, you, right and you stomp on the crawling ones. <laughs> we kill them. We buy sprays and other things to eradicate them, get rid of it. We don't want it around when we hate things. And so it says in this parable, his citizens hated him. And what had many of the people of the Jews been trying to do? Kill. They've been trying to, yeah, get rid of him. Right, get rid of him. Kill him, banish him, flog him, scandalize him, shoo him away. Don't be receptive to anything he has to say. Contradict him at every turn. That's how you show, or that's how hate was shown toward Jesus. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to subscribe to his teachings. They, they hated him. Okay? And even as this is unfolding, some are plotting for his ultimate demise. Okay? Okay? 
see our questions are. So we, we see who the audience is. And why was this the right time for this parable? We haven't gotten through the whole thing yet, but why was it, what, what time was it? I don't mean what time of day, but in Jesus's life, where were they in, in, in relationship to his lifespan? He was on his way to being crucified. Right, it was very nearly over. He was coming to the climax of his existence. And so this was the time to kind of get the record, get the record straight. He's tempted, and people were getting excited because here we here they are getting close to Jerusalem, and they were all expecting this climax for this kingdom to come into being. So once again, just as Jesus had the huge following at an earlier point where he said, wait a minute, if you're gonna follow me, you're gonna have to bear a cross. Now, as they're getting close to the end of this journey, he says, wait a minute, understand the reality of this situation. Because many of the folks that were following, well, as the parable says, they didn't really like him, but they were looking forward to this kingdom and what it might bring for them. So he tells this parable. Any other thoughts on 11 through 15? If not now, the, the, this nobleman has returned. He is officially, he has been installed as king, and now he's coming back to perform an accounting or a, a reconciliation with those servants. So if somebody would, please pick up at verse 16 and take us through 21. Okay, this is from, do, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. This is from NIV. The first one came and said, Sir, your minion has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. The second came and said, Sir, your minion has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Go to 20. Yes. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your minion. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. Go ahead and read 21 as well. Okay. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. All right. So what was the problem? Or what was the what was the report of the first two servants that came to the king, to the now king and reported? What was their report? They took the money and earned more. They either earned ten or five or whatever, but they earned more. They just didn't lay it around. They they put it into something and earned more money for it. And what did that show? That they were all they listened to what he said. He told him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to put it to work, and they 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 did this. So, when not you, only yeah. did they listen, they followed directions, right? They, they, they were obedient, yes. He gave them, he, he didn't just hand them the pound instructions. and walk away, he gave them specific instructions. Put this to work while I'm gone so that when I come back, I will have more than what I gave you. But Deacon Davis, one other point is that he didn't tell them exactly what to do with it. So it's choice. So you forget it, it you, that it's about choice. And he it's said, about choice with us. He told, he told them to put it to work. And That's you're right. right. You're exactly right. How you put it to work? It was up to well, them. That's up to you. You that one, what well, the first two thought putting it to work means let me go out and do things with it that will cause it to grow. Mm -hmm. The other, the third servant that came to him, he put his own, he, he took what he thought he knew about the the nobleman and used that as an excuse to do nothing. 
other than preserve exactly what he had been given. He didn't, he didn't waste it, he didn't squander it, but he also didn't use it for, to get value out of it, to add or to add to it. What is what how does that what does that got to do with us? We have to be careful about the choices that we make when we think about following him. Okay. We have to Can listen hear and me? obey what he's asked us to do. And that third one didn't. Okay. Also, can you hear me, Tommy? I can. Okay. Um, what I thought about it was, like, when we get saved, is it just us? We're being saved. Lord, I'm saved. Do we go out and try to recruit other people? Uh, to increase the kingdom. And that's what I kind of thought about it when I thought about mm -hmm. increasing. And and you're you're exactly right. Re scripture, it, it all ties together. And we will, at, if you go back and look at the end of Matthew, that's what his final instruction was to followers of him. Go out and make disciples of all men and women by teaching them what I have taught you. In other words, what I give to you, it's not just for you, it's for you to use to attract others to this way. And so that panel could have been, or for us, it could be the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Jesus, that we are to take that and not just hold on to it, and have our own joyous occasions and celebrations in our own hearts and in our own minds and in our own households, but to spread it abroad because other people too will be attracted and will be converted by it. And that's the growth Jesus is looking for. That's the growth God is looking for. I gave you me so that you could give me to everybody you came in contact with. And so that's that's exactly right. That's a great point that what this nobleman was looking for, he gave his servants money or ten, a pound and said, put it to work and make it grow. Jesus gives to us an opportunity for salvation, and we need to make it available to others to tell everybody about this wonderful God who's, who loves you and will provide everything you will ever need if you come and follow him. So yes, that charge he gave those 10 servants with the pound is the same charge he gives us as believers. I have saved you so that you could be an instrument and getting others to also seek salvation and perhaps one day be saved. So excellent point, excellent point. And, and what was it, was there a, a reward associated with being obedient in terms of the kingdom, that kingdom that this, this nobleman became, was king of? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And what what was the reward that we hear about in this parable? He will make them ruler over certain cities. Okay. Yeah. The, the first servant came back and said, "Look, I took your pound and made ten others." He said, "Good job. I'll yeah. make you ruler over ten cities." Mm -hmm. The second servant came and said, "I took this pound and made five others." He said, "Good job too." I'll make you ruler over five cities. Mm -hmm. But the third one came and said, you know what? I'm, I'm smart. And I'm based on how I knew you were a, a, a hard man and that you reaped where you didn't sow. You took up where you did not put down. And I just preserved what you had because I was afraid of you. Now, what does that have to do with being obedient? 
that you come back and tell me who I am and how you felt about me. And as a result, that was your reason for being disobedient. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't understand his reasoning. Since he was so afraid of him, why didn't he do as he was told? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this man, there's a scripture in there. The, the truth is nigh thee. It's nowhere, it's, it's not in you. You're just lying to me. You're not being mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. You just didn't want to be, you were just disobedient. Period. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear you a story. Don't tell me who I am, and because you, because of who you thought I was, that's why you did. I don't want to hear that. I told you to put it to work so that when I came back, it would be more than what I gave you. Now you can throw all your imaginations and all your learning and all your understanding, but none of that supersedes my instruction. Put it to work so that when I return. It is more than what it started out. Every And that's how it's going to be at the judgment. You got a whole life of stories to tell, of heartaches and hardships and all. But God, he, he's not going to want to hear that. I told you to be faithful over what I had given you and to put it to use to love your enemy, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are my instructions. Don't tell me, well, Lord, you know that community I lived in, those were some dangerous and scary people, so I didn't go out and talk to them, especially when it got dark. I kept, I locked up my doors and I kept to myself. But that's not what I told you to do. I told you to go the highways and the byways and beat the bushes and tell everybody you would encountered, tell them all about me, about what a wonderful God I am and what I have in store for them if they choose to be a follower. But you took what I gave you and you just sat on it. You wrapped it in your napkin and you stayed in your house with the doors locked and the windows barred and the doors bolted and, and you kept yourself safe, but you didn't do what I told you to do. Do we all have stories that we could tell? Yes. And are any of our stories more important than God's instructions? They're not. But can we make them seem that way? Yes. We have reasons for not helping other people. We have reasons for not going to visit the sick. We have reasons for not going to church. We have reasons for not being in usher. We have reasons for not singing on the choir. We have reasons for not helping clean up after a, a social event at the church. We got reasons to, to miss all the funerals except our own. We got, we got reasons. And we've got excuses. We've got stories to tell. But are any of them more important than the story that Jesus told or that Jesus told? Or the one that God told that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should be saved and not kept. So that takes us, we'll get back to our parable now, but this noble man comes back. The first two servants showed obedience and they were rewarded with what this noble man had. He was, he had a kingdom and he had what he could reward you with was a piece of his kingdom. So the first servant made 10 pounds on top of the one he gave him. So he made him ruler over 10 cities. The second servant made five pounds off of the one he gave him. He made him ruler over five cities. But here came another servant that said, because of my own thoughts, because of my own reasoning, I decided not to put that pound that you gave me to work, but I held on to it, and here's your pound. What was this servant's reward? We haven't read it yet, so let's get to that. So if somebody would, please take verses 22 
through through 27. Then we'll discuss at the end. He said, you're right that I don't suffer fools gladly. And you mm -hmm. acted the fool. Why didn't you at least invest the money in security so I would have gotten a little interest on it? Then he said to those standing there, take the money from him and give it to the servant who doubled my take, my stake. They said, but master, he already has doubled. He said, that's what I mean. Risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding a bag. As for these enemies of mine who petition against my rule, clear them out of here. I don't want to see their faces around here again. All right. Yeah, we, we had, I, I neglected to point out a, another group of, of the citizens that hated him. They not only didn't want him, they actually sent derogatory information ahead of the uh, ahead of the nobleman to the I guess the council that was going to appoint him king and and they threw all this dirt out about him that he that this council might be persuaded not to even make him king to begin with but that was ignored I was like they stole the election it wasn't legitimate we need to do it over we need to make me king no that's not true the election was held, we have a king. So that group, he deals with them. After he deals with this one, the servant that, that did nothing with it, what was the what was his what was the instruction for him? Did he the get NIV to hold on to that one? I'm the sorry. NIV, I'm sorry. <laughs> the NIV is a little bit harsher. Yeah. Um they at the end he actually tells them to kill this man. And, and King James, yes, is, is equally as harsh. It says, from him that has not even that he has shall be taken away from him. And then, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. In other words, I want to see them die. Right. So, yes, that for that group, that didn't want him to even be made king, never mind serve under him, the punishment was extreme. But for the one who held on to it and did nothing with it, what was his what was his sentence? What was his reward? He said, take what he has and give it to the one who had 10. Exactly. And so, so take even what he has. Mm -hmm. You didn't you you didn't put it to work. Take it take it away from him and leave him with nothing. Right. He wasn't put to death on the spot, but what he had was taken away from him and given to the one who was who had prospered the most by being obedient. Right. And then for those who rejected him out of hand. They were absolutely just were, were killed before him. Right. That's pretty harsh. And who are we talking about all along that group? Again, we established that the citizens were the Jews. And some of them rejected him all along from the very beginning, didn't want to hear anything he had to say. That punishment is going to be pretty severe for them. But the ones who, whatever they had, it was taken away from them. You're going to have to try to live this life without the presence of God, which is going to be a tormented life. But for those who put it to work, it says, if you risk my life, if you risk your life for me, what version was that you were reading from? I think that was Miss Himes that was. Ms. Himes? I didn't hear you. And what version was that you read from? I read from the message. No, oh, okay. The message talked about if you risk your life, 
you will be rewarded in ways you can't even imagine. And so that's what, if, if you're willing to give your life over to God, you will, there's no way you're going to miss anything because he will bless, he will so richly and so gloriously bless you. You won't even think about what you gave up to be his father. Can anybody witness to that? Anybody yes. that living for God is, is worth anything you feel like you had to sacrifice. Yes. Because when you are living for God, you, you can have that peace that passes understanding. You can have joy when all around you seems to be chaotic and in turmoil. You can have peace. You can have joy. You can be comforted. And those things are priceless. You cannot put a price on it. When you can lay your head down on the pillow and sleep comfortably, peacefully, there is nothing like that. But what does, it, what does it take to get there? What does it take to be there? We have to put our hand in God's hand. We have to put our hands in God's hand. We have to, as we started out talking about, where I said if God is 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 everywhere all the time. How is it that we can miss him? When we don't intentionally look for God, we become subject to everything Satan has to put in front of us to distract us, to discourage us, to upset us, to rile us up we become his plaything and he will torment the soul, the mind, the body, your thoughts. That's what he does. But when we can settle, can steal ourselves and see how God is working in every inch, every aspect of our lives, we can rejoice because we know Yes, Satan, you're coming at me in every way you know how. Everything in this natural world sometimes seems stacked up against me. But you know what? The sun rose this morning, and my God woke me up. And he did the same thing yesterday. And I trust that if he does it tomorrow, he'll bring me through tomorrow as well. So Satan, you know what? You've been at me my whole life, but my God has sustained me through it all. He has victory over you. And since I am in him, I too have victory over you. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And because he lives, all fear should be gone. Because we know who holds the future. So that's how we can get to that point where we can not feel like we're ever alone because that's, that's what Satan, that's what he's, that's what he tries to do. He tries to convince you that you're out here on your own and you've got to do whatever you think is right to protect you, to look out for you, that nobody else has your interests at heart. And we can get caught up in that so easily because so much about this, well, everything about this world is against us when we are ally ourselves or align ourselves with God. 
everything worldly becomes an enemy or a distraction or a hindrance to you trying to live a godly life. All you'll see is what other people have and you don't have. All you'll think about is what you want but have not yet achieved. But when you have God and he teaches you that his grace is sufficient, all those things are no longer stress points in your life. All of a sudden you'll realize that you have more than enough. But we've got to spend as much energy acknowledging God's goodness in our lives as we spend letting or allowing Satan to convince us that we don't have enough. We don't have, oh, God's grace isn't sufficient. You need more on top of that. And that creates so much stress for us. So God was, Jesus was preparing these, his followers or those people who were following him. That, yeah, some of you are fine where you fit in in this parable. Are you the servants that took my path and was obedient to my instructions? Were you the one that went out and worked it as hard as you could, that you multiplied it times 10? Or did you just do, you know, you did a good job and you multiplied it by five? Or are you the one that said, you know what? I'm kind of comfortable right where I am. If I can just maintain, I'll be all right. And you wrap it up in a napkin and put it in a safe deposit box and just wait for the person to come back and say, here it is. I paid my debt. With his, this is what you gave me. I'm going to continue to do things my way. And what's good for me? No. Where do you fit in? Or were you never bought into it at all? You were a skeptic from the outset. Matter of fact, you were a troublemaker. You, you, you tried to put stumbling blocks in, in the path of those believers. Are you in that group? So here they are about to enter Jerusalem. And the next segment of Luke is going to talk about Jesus's, Jesus enters Jerusalem. And we know what that was like. Again, these same folks who are listening to these parables, oftentimes a majority of the audience didn't understand what he was talking about. They thought he was just flapping his gums. And they listened, they didn't understand, they didn't ask questions, they didn't pray about it, they didn't seek an understanding, they just had their, had their own thoughts, what this end is going to be like. And they're just following to get to the end that they think is going to be the end. Not understanding Jesus' teachings and his warnings to them and to the rest of us. What if, what if you had a church filled with people like that? What would that church be achieving? Would it be growing? No. It's often the state police are sort of the lead in this investigation. Uh, and we should, I hope, hear from more formally. Mm -hmm. Would the members be excited about going there? Would they be telling other folks about it? No thoughts, no comments on that? Which servants are you talking about? The ones that were obedient or the disobedient one? Well, this basically the ones in that parable, if you, if you had a bunch of just hangers on, what kind of what kind of church would it be if everybody was like those first two servants? Yeah, great church. 
it, it would be growing, there would be energy, there'd be obedience, there'd be a, a, a whole lot of good stuff going on. But what about that, the third one, who just held on to it? What kind of church would that be? It would be a stagnant church. It wouldn't be growing. It would be maintaining, but it wouldn't be growing, or at least not like it could be. You'd have you'd have each person holding on to what they had, kind of being sheltered, not willing to take risk or, or go the extra mile. It would be a pretty boring church. It would be a dying church. It, it, that's exactly right. Because that's what that servant was. He was dying. And you see, when the king came back, he said, take what he has, take that away from him which is going to push him closer to that grade. That's exactly what happens when you don't live in obedience to God. You are, you are dying. You are spiritually dying. And that's what he's talking about. That pound he gave them was his, we can relate it to the nobleman being Jesus. What he gives us is his spirit. And it's not for us to sit on, it's for us to nurture and to share. Because then when you share that spirit, it will be nurtured by the person you shared it with, and then they will share, and so on and so on. And it will, it will cause the church to grow. And that's what we've been called to do. Any other thoughts on this parable of the of the ten pounds? Let's go make sure we've covered all the points. Who is the audience? It was his followers, all those folks that were following him. And we know there are all kinds of folks in the audience. True believers, some skeptics, some enemies, some that hate you. And some, like I said, some true, some true believers, but most of them aren't. Why was this the right time? Because it was getting close to what was going to happen in Jerusalem over the next little period of time was going to shake nearly everybody to their core. So you need to be sure before you get in the fire, you better be sure you're holding on to God's hand. How did the citizens receive him? Well, the citizens hated him. They didn't receive him. They didn't want him to be their king. And so when we reflect reflect on the lessons, I think I had a line in there that, ha that may not have made it on you. It was the haves and the have-nots. So what was it that, what is it that we all had? Oh, it is there. The haves and the have-nots. Let's reflect on that. In this parable, who had something? Come on, it was it was a noble man who was made king, but then he called his servants and he gave each one of them a pound. So they all, all 10 of the servants started out as the haves. Okay. And what did two of the haves do? They used what they had been given. And they got more. Yes, they they got more. Supported. And then how did the one that was a have, how did he become a have not? The amount they had was taken away. Two people were talking. I said he did not increase what he was given. And it was okay. taken away. So it was taken away from him. Right. So you become a have not through your disobedience. Again, all these servants had to do, they didn't have to, all they had to do was follow instructions. 
You didn't have to make up new instructions or you didn't have to create a new game. Just follow the instructions you were given. The nobleman said, take this pound and put it to work. What could your only excuse be with that instruction? If you didn't know what put it to work means, would that be an excuse? No. Well, and even if that was, if that was a fact, what's, what's the remedy for that? Ask somebody who knows how to put it to work. How do you make this work? But apparently it was something that the nobleman was convinced that each of those servants knew what that meant. And so again, a little while ago, we talked about when you understand something, you become responsible for something. So because they understood what it meant to make put this to work, you are responsible for doing that. You have knowledge of it. You have an understanding of it. You become responsible for what you're supposed to do with it. Is that where we are as believers? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. What do we have? We have the knowledge of of. God who gave his son that we might have a right to eternal life. What's our responsibility because we understand that? Everybody, what's our responsibility? To build the kingdom. Huh? To be well, we don't like them when they come to our doors. They're called Jehovah's what? Witness. Witness. We've got to be witnesses. We've got to go out and tell as many people as we encounter about this God that we serve. And what we don't know, we need to be diligent about trying to learn more so that we can tell other people more about this incredible God. We understand it. We are therefore responsible. And God's coming back. Jesus is coming back. And just like in this parable, what'd you do with what I gave you? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew how, I knew you, Peter, had preached on the day of Pentecost, and he saved 3,000. I know you've been saving people all along. I knew you had done your part, and Peter did his part. So I just, I just held mine right here. I'm still saved. I gave my money in church. I participated. But what did you do with it? Did you share it? Did you tell anybody about it? Did you try to live it? Because we understand it, we are responsible for it. So let us definitely not be like those who, who was non-believers from the beginning and, and hated the idea of this, this noble man being made king. Let us for sure not be him or be that type of servant. Let us also not be that servant that just sat on it and did nothing with it, because not only did you not grow, but what you had is going to be taken away from you and given to somebody else. And what, that's, what they're talking about taking away are the blessings that come from being obedient. The two obedient servants, they were rewarded. They got rewards, such as the nobleman had. He had pieces of his kingdom to give them. He gave one of them ten rulers over 10 cities, another one rulership over five cities. But for the one who did nothing, take what he had. Put them back out there in the fields, put them back to work, put them at the low end of the totem pole. But for those who were obedient, reward them now. And all of our, our greatest reward comes in the next life. But God rewards those who are obedient to him right now. He rewards us right now. And let us not look for the rewards with, with commas, decimal points, and dollar signs, but let us look for the God's rewards and the, the peace, the joy he can give us, the fellowship he allows us to share with, have with others, 
Let's look for those godly rewards in godly places. So let's read our continue to read our scriptures, pray, and fellowship with one another so that we can reap God's blessings in this life and not be sitting around allowing Satan to convince us that there's no rewards to this thing you say you're doing. You need to get out here and cut loose like everybody else. Any other thoughts on today's lesson? We are one minute before wrap-up. Any announcements? I just want to say, Deacon Davis, that for those who attend Sunday school, what we studied today is going to be a continuation because this coming Sunday, the lesson is about obedience and the reward for being obedient. Look at that. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Himes, for sharing that with us. Anybody else have anything else on today's lesson or a past lesson or future lessons or just anything they'd like to say to the group? I heard from Mrs. Wigfall yesterday that Carmen's knee replacement surgery went well. Well, praise Great. God. Great. Thank you for sharing. As always, if anybody feels led, please feel free to close us out in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this hour that you have allowed us to gather together and look at your word and study it, Father God. We pray, Lord, that all that we have said, all that we've thought, all that we've shared has been pleasing in thy sight. Lord God, we know that we are all sinners saved by grace, and we know that we continuously fall short. But Father God, we are careful to acknowledge our weakness and your strength. And we thank you, God, for you being an all-powerful, all-loving, all-kind, all-knowing, and such a merciful God that you give us new days repeatedly that we can do better each day than we did the day before. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and the opportunity to study it together on Wednesdays at noon. We pray that you will continue to have mercy on us as we continue to work out our salvation. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray this and all other prayers, and we say amen. 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 And there Everybody was another high school movie. shooting. I'm sorry. There's another high school shooting today. I just wanted us to keep them in our prayers. It oh bothers me God. every time I see that. <laughs> Where yeah. was it? In Georgia. Oh, in Georgia. Wow. I don't know the details. It was. It flashed across the screen. Oh, and two, wow. two are dead. I don't know if it's students, oh, teachers, goodness. or who. Oh, wow. Okay. But just, you know, our kids go to school every day, and we have to pray every day. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. I don't have any kids in school, but I pray for them too. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day and, and the rest of your week. God bless you all. Bless you. Thank you. And the same to you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.